What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Battles of the American Civil War, and we're fresh off of the Battle of Fort Sumter, the first official shots fired during the war, the official start of the war. And uh, we're just getting heated up on this show as we got a lot more battles to go. We're only one official battle in, and today we got, like I was saying last week, we have official, uh, uh, there's only there's only like 380 official battles recognized official as uh, like designated battlefields by whatever the CWCA or something. Um, if you look at the map, it shows you all of them. And then there's another couple thousand skirmishes and smaller battles that aren't, like the battlefields aren't officially designated, but nonetheless, there were still uh, battles and skirmishes. And we have four of those for you today as they're not really battles. Just a little, you know, shots fired back and forth, kind of like posturing and showing, uh, you know, like a pissing contest between right. the two. We've got the Battle of Gloucester Point, Sewell's Point, the Battle of Sewell's Point, the Battle of Aquia Creek, and the Battle of Philippi, which all occurred, all four of those occurred from May 7th through June 3rd. Gloucester starting June uh, May 7th and Philippi being June 3rd. So uh, in one month, we got four of those battles, and these are in chronological order after uh, Sumter. So right after Sumter was Gloucester's Point, then Sewell's Point, Aquia Creek, and then Philippi in that order, in that range, and... Yeah, that's how we told you we're going to do it. We're, no matter battle, big or small, we're covering them all. Cover them all because <laughs> they're all important. We just got a new tagline. Mm. Hey, there's no battle, big or small. We will cover them all. Hey, <laughs> the Battle of Gloucester Point, Virginia, was the first reported exchange of fire in the American Civil War following the surrender of Fort Sumter. On April 15, 1861, the day after the U.S. Army garrison surrendered Fort Sumter to Confederate forces, Abraham Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers, like we said last week to suppress the rebellion of the seven deep South slave states. Right. And uh, he wanted to reclaim federal property that had been seized by them Four upper lot. South states that permitted slavery, including Virginia refused to furnish troops for this purpose and immediately began the process of secession from the union to join the Confederacy. And Abraham right. Lincoln didn't like that. Virginia was like, you know, we were, we were, we were just going to be sitting here like Sweden. Right. But now that you're trying to get my guys, Mm. I don't think so, man, mm. especially when I already know what you want to do mm. to my uh, slave rights here. Mm. Mm. Can't do it. Mm -hmm. We got to go. We got to go. 17th, April, 1861. The delegates previously elected to the Virginia Succession Convention in Richmond passed an ordinance of succession from the Union. The ordinance was subject to a ratification vote of the people of the state to be held on the 23rd of May, 1861. Yeah. Yeah. But the actions of the convention and the Virginia's governor, John Letcher, effectively took Virginia out of the union before the vote could even be taken. Well, obviously they're like, Hey, we're going to secede. We're going to uh, give three weeks to vote on it. No, you guys already said you're going to do it. You, right. You're already out pretty much as the convention authorized the governor to call for volunteers to join the military forces of Virginia to defend the state against federal military action. Oh, Virginia, Virginia, on April 22nd, uh, governor Letcher appointed Robert E. Lee as commander in chief of Virginia's army and Navy forces. On April 24th, Virginia and the Confederate states agreed that the Virginian forces would be under the overall direction of the Confederate President Jefferson Davis. As these developments show that Virginia would complete the process of succession, <laughs> succession, Lincoln was like, you know what? I'm not even waiting for that little vote on the 23rd of May. He goes, guess what, guys? I made it for you. You're now part of the Confederate States of America. Yes, sir. Whether you like it or not now. 27th of April, 1861, Lincoln extended the blockade of the seven original Confederate states that went up to South Carolina. And he was like, we need to add North Carolina and Virginia to I this list. why North Carolina, though. Yeah, North Carolina hasn't even done anything. Yeah, because he already knew, though. We can't have that little gap in between. Yes, right. Uh, May 3rd, 1861, Major General Robert E. Lee of the Virginia Forces appointed Colonel William B. Talaferro, Taliaferro, Commander of Defenses of Gloucester Point, Virginia, on the York River, opposite of Yorktown, Virginia. All right. General Lee instructed the colonel to cooperate with Virginia Navy Captain William Whittle okay. in the construction and defense of a shore battery hey, to cover uh, the York River at that location. His initials are WCW. WCW. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, so he's now uh, William Whittle is uh, constructing – defense of the shore battery to cover the york river at that location so uh Sweet. we all know that the so far we know that the confederate army likes to build up and the union, union army just likes to watch them and go what, what are they doing they're, like, they're not even serious they're, not they're like uh look at these guys they got a bunch of like 
a bunch of our posts and all these states, guys, we have nothing left from any of these. There's like a couple little spots that we got, but nah, they're not doing anything. <laughs> they're not serious. They're not. They can't. We don't even recognize them. They're still here. <laughs> so stupid. 6th of May, 1861, Talia Farrow ordered a company of 50 filthy men. <laughs> I want, filthy I want the filthiest <laughs> men. <laughs> I want the filthiest damn men you got. Uh, he ordered a company of 50 men of the Richmond Howitzers, a Virginia Volunteer Artillery Regiment, with two six-pounder cannons, and he wanted them to report to Gloucester Point to assist in the defense and operation of the shore batteries. He's like, we need those guys. Get them over there. 50 more. The artillery men arrived at Gloucester in uh, May 7th in 1861. This force had not yet been formally transferred to the Confederate States Army so or, or to the, the Navy. Navy. Yeah. So there's just... Uh, on their own, I guess, with the backing of Confederate states. But the Virginians were acting in concert with the uh, uh, concert uh, with the Confederacy, and it's in the, so basically they're they're Confederate. I mean, obviously, we already uh, established that they're under the control of the Confederate Army anyway, or at least the Confederacy. I don't think the Army is even official yet. Not yet. In early May of nineteen or eighteen sixty one, the Union Navy already had learned that Rebel Virginia forces were construction fortifications at Gloucester Point. Uh, on the York River on May 7th, Union Flag Officer Garrett J. Pendergrass ordered Navy Lieutenant Thomas O. Selfridge Jr. Okay. to examine the reported fortifications. Okay, why don't you go check that out? Yeah, All right. Out. On the same day, Sel- building. <laughs> there they are. They're doing it. Right. <laughs> Lieutenant <laughs> Selfridge on that same day in command of the USS Yankee, which was a converted steam tugboat of 328 tons with two guns. Sailed the Yankee up the York River in a reconnaissance, <laughs> reconnaissance with the purpose of developing intelligence on the fortifications of Gloucester Point. Okay. Yeah, intelligence that uh they thought they can they can sneak in a, a steamboat and nobody would notice. Right. No. Sorry, right, guys. Oh, we're just we're just tucking along. Don't, right. don't mind us. It's a moving along, boys. Don't, don't mind don't mind these guns that are on the uh right. side of our ship either. Don't worry about them. As the Yankee approached to within about two thousand yards of the shore. The battery fired a shot across the boat's bow. The Yankee slowly continued on its course. The battery then fired another shot at the boat. Lieutenant Selfridge reported that the shore battery fired 12 shots at the Yankee. But in a later account, T. Roberts Baker of the Richmond Howitzers stated that Virginia forces had shot 13. <laughs> He's like, nah, uh <laughs> You forgot that last one. I forgot one. that last one. Selfridge is like, you're right. Uh, Lieutenant Selfridge reported that all but two of the batteries... Uh, the battery shots were short. The Yankee fired four shots and two shells at the battery in return. So did the other two had to hit, hit him? Had to have. Had to have. Right? All but two were short. All right? Or maybe the other twos went over? I don't know. Hmm. Selfridge stated that he could not hit the opposing force's guns because of the elevation and because his guns were too small to damage the battery and fort- fortifications I mean, in any event. It's like they didn't learn from Fort Sumner at all. They didn't. I mean, it's only two weeks out. Jeez. What are they supposed to do in two weeks? Maybe it worked this time. I need bigger guns. Right. Wow. Uh, the Yankees' gun. The Yankees' guns were light thirty twos. Selfridge pinned that the rebels had two long thirty twos and an eight inch eight inch shell. He thought the rebels had a force of about forty men. Well, he was about right. He had actually filthy men. Yes. <laughs> Fil- fifty filthy men. 50 filthy. In fact, the battery only had smaller six pounder guns on this date. So uh, wow. he overestimated what they had. Maybe right. maybe the um, guns sounded like. Um, Long 32s, but they weren't right. right. But two of them. I mean, the problem is they had the light 32s on that, and they're made for uh, close to close, right? Hand to hand boat contact, boat to boat contact, boat to boat contact. Where you, you, um, you could pull up next to each other and start shooting. Either or, it's clear <laughs> that the Confederate didn't even have um, big guns either because all of them were short except for two, right? So they weren't even hitting their long ones. So there's no way they could have had long 32s, no. After the exchange of cannon fire, the Yankee turned around and headed for its base. <laughs> They're like, ah, that's enough. They went to Hampton Roads near Fort Monroe. Selfridge did not mention damage to the Yankee in his report, but T. Roberts Baker of the Virginia Force, he said, uh, pretty sure two shots uh, hit the Yankee guys. I'm pretty sure. Neither side reported any of their men killed or wounded. Ah, so Baker saying, yeah, I'm pretty sure we hit them. A lot of them were short, but there's at least two and. It coincides with Selford saying uh, all but two were all short. Two, right. <laughs> Despite Baker's later account that Colonel Talia Farrow directed the actions of the Richmond Howitzers at Gloucester Point, uh, Talaferio stated in a report on May 8, 1861, that he arrived at Gloucester Point after the engagement had taken place. 
He said that Captain Whittle had directed the firing at the Yankee. Whittle has denied this. Uh oh. Both of these guys are captains and colonels and stuff. Why would not one of them take credit for it? Because they didn't get the major call from the head guy. Why? Why he's the colonel? What more do you want? A general? Isn't the only who's above a colonel? The colonel is typically above the rank of lieutenant colonel. <laughs> the rank above colonel is typically called a brigadier, oh, or the brigadier general, general or the brigadier general. Right. And then the general. Right. 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 Or than like the major general. Right. Like, they have so many freaking ranks. It's just crazy. It's crazy. But still, colonel's obviously one of the top goes. Right. So he still wasn't the highest. So he had to take answers from somebody else. Lieutenant John Thompson Brown of the Richmond Howitzers was in immediate command of the small forces of artillery men who manned the battery at this very time. Some sources credit him with firing the first cannon shot of the Civil War in Virginia. Brown was promoted to captain May 9th, 1861. Good for him. By May 11th, the Virginians had placed two nine inch guns at the battery at Gloucester Point and had two more ready for placement there. By June 25th, the Confederates had 14 heavy guns in place at the battery. Mm. Jeez. The men of Richmond Howitzers were relieved and moved from Gloucester Point to Yorktown on May 26th of 1861. So, did they take Yorktown? Yorktown? Uh, not yet, right? The Richmond Howitzers participated in the Battle of Big Bethel. I guess Yorktown was already in um, Virginia. So, right. Uh, the Richmond Howitzers participated in the Battle of Big Bethel, which we will cover on the 10th of June. Coming up quick. Similar minor engagements between Union and gunboats uh, and Virginia shore batteries occurred soon after the action at Gloucester. Uh, at the Battle of Sewell's, we'll get to that. Yes. Battle of uh, Quaya, uh -huh. we'll get to that. And the Battle of Pig Point, which is later on. Which will be next week. The Battle of Gloucester Point can be considered with those subsequent actions as part of the Union campaign to blockade the Chesapeake Bay and the entire coast of the southern states. Oh, yeah, no shit. All right, that leads us into uh, the old Battle, the Battle of, of Sewell. Sewell's Point, which takes place May 18, 19, and 21st in Norfolk County, Virginia. Um, it was 1861. 1861, and obviously, it's not like we jumped five years. You never still, know. Man. We're still, from here on out, unless we change years, we're in 1861, guys. Right. Um, it was an inconclusive exchange of cannon fire, so more uh, more ship battle between the Union gunboat USS Monticello, supported by the USS Thomas Freeborn, and the Confederate batteries on Sewell's Point that took place on, like I said, May 18th, 19th, and 21st. Um, so here again, we have just Union boats, no Confederate boats yet. Right. Still battling. Those, those guys are just sitting on the shore firing at the boats, and boats are just like, hey, hey. Uh, okay. I think the, the, the Confederate did it smart there. Cause they were like, if we go and fight on the water, we're going to lose right now with, with the equipment we have, which was limited, very limited. Cause they didn't even have a stockpile of ammunition or anything yet. Cannons and all that. Yeah. They had, they had a surplus. Well, I'm pretty sure we'll see, uh, in this battle, the Confederate gets its like first ship or its main ship. All right. So thanks to the union during the night of April 20th. The commander of the U.S. Gosport Navy Yard in Norfolk County, Virginia, which is now the Norfolk Naval Yard in the city of Portsmouth, Charles S. McCauley, he was that guy who was running on the 20th of April in 1861, fearing he could not hold the yard against the rebels and although without instructions from authorities in D.C., ordered the evacuation and burning of the yard and any ships that could not be sailed away. He said, what about, they, they're like, what about the Merrimack? He said, Burn it. Burn it all. Burn it all. Let's go. Are you sure? Yeah. Well, as we'll see later, he didn't do a very good job of burning it. This ended the presence of Union land forces in the Norfolk area of Southampton Roads for over one year. They needed it. And uh, Virginia Militia Major General and effective May 1st, 1861, Virginia Provisional Army Brigadier General nice. Walter Gwynn. A uh, former U.S. Army engineering officer and former railroad engineer and surveyor. Ooh cited and supervised the construction of batteries to defend Norfolk in late April and early May, including the battery at Sewell's Point. Gwynn commanded the defense of Norfolk until he was relieved by regular Confederate forces on May 23rd of 1861. Sir, you are relieved of your duties. Now go build us a railroad. Okay. And all you Patreoners right here, you can see the actual battle of uh, the battle land inside this red circle that I'm saying that I'm circling right here is actually where the shots got fired. Right. And then this whole yellow and black is like the surveyed land mm -hmm. that they classified. So look at they went all the way down here. They did. Because I wonder if they found anything outside like cannonballs or something. I bet. Outside this area. In think, here. Right. 
<laughs> that's, that's what I said. I wonder. So you never know. It's a nice little uh, area. It is. As part of the Union blockade of Chesapeake Bay during the American Civil War, the Union gunboat USS Monticello, commanded by Captain Henry Eagle with Lieutenant, who later became Rear Admiral Daniel L. Brain, exchanged cannon fire with the Confederate batteries on Sewell's Point in Norfolk County in an attempt to reinforce or an attempt to enforce the blockade of the Hampton Roads area in the southeastern Virginia. Okay. So they're uh, trying to get that blockade up, and I don't think it's working. The two sides did each other little harm. On May 18th, the Monticello fired on the unfinished Confederate battery at Sewell's Point, which commanded the entrance to the Elizabeth River and the harbor at Norfolk, hmm. but which had no guns yet in place, and it had no effect. No effect. Um, by 5 p.m. on May 19th, the Confederates had installed three 32-pound guns at Sewell's Point Battery, when the Monticello began to fire on the works at about 5.30, oh. the battery returned fire, which drove off the Monticello. So of they let them, they, they were firing on them. They somehow let them put two 32-pound guns, get fired back on, and immediately they're like, no, nah, nah, this ain't for me. <laughs> and then they're like, <laughs> bye, <laughs> go right. on. Jeez, old Pete. Jeez. That's like a, a, a boxer never boxed a match in his life. And getting his first hit, fight. As soon as he gets punched <laughs> in the jaw one time, he's, he's nope. like, this ain't for me. <laughs> no, I'm done. <laughs> oh, peace. Bye. Captain Peyton H. Colquitt of the Columbus Light Guard from Georgia commanded this battery. Captain Colquitt raised a Georgia State flag at the battery since he did not have a Confederate flag. Do they even have a flag right now? They do. I don't think so. It's only two months after the, they formed. I think they might have the the battle flag right now, but not the the country flag yet. The country flag is the stars and bars. March 4th. 1861. So they don't even have it. <clears throat> not yet. Wait, February, March. Yeah, March. February, so this March, is April, May. This is May. For so they have the stars and bars flew from March 4th to May. Hmm. What, they got another flag after that? So this is the stars and bars. Okay, their first one was a circle. With the eight states, and then they went. To oh, 13. then they went. No, the then they went to nine. Then they went. And to then the they went to eleven, colonies. and then they went to yeah, the thirteen original. So right now they're fi They're fi They're flying. Well, I don't know. This is the twenty. This is the nineteen. So right now they're flying the seven star flag. All right, and then May twenty first, they're going to move to the eight or the nine. nine I mean, it's North Carolina, I believe, uh, comes up here too, huh? Captain Payton H. Colquitt, we already said that. He didn't have the Confederate flag, he, so he raised the Georgia state flag. Right. Uh, 21st of May, though, the Monticello fired two shots at the battery, but again drew off when the battery returned fire. They're like, no, they're still shooting back, and we got to go. After the battle, the USS Thomas Freeborn joined the Federal Potomac Flotilla under the command of Commander James H. Ward. The Thomas Freeborn attacked the Confederate batteries at the confluence of the Potomac River and the Aquia, Aquia, the Aquia, Aquia Creek Aquia. in the Battle of Aquia Creek, obviously. Which we are about to get to. Yes. On the 29th of May and the 30th, and then the June of the 1st. Well, speaking of the Battle of Aquia. And guess what? Little to no effect. Yep. Battle of Aquia Creek was an exchange of cannon fire between Union Navy gunboats and Confederate shore batteries. Again, Gunboats versus shore, and the Confederates are always the ones. Who, I don't understand it. Still, yeah, the Potomac River has confluence with the Quaya Creek in Stafford yeah. County, Virginia. Ver. <laughs> the battle took place from May 29th to June 1st of 1861. <laughs> the Confederates set up several shore batteries to block Union military and commercial vessels from moving into the Chesapeake Bay and along the lower Potomac River, as well as for defensive purposes. I mean, several shore batteries so they're just lining it's like literally lining the shore all the way around it's with almost just, with just guns a blazing it's almost if these guys know how to protect themselves right <laughs> it's almost like um some of the most advanced armies were probably in the south or you know the best i mean robert e lee was a genius uh. The battery of Aquia also was intended to protect the railroad terminal at that very location. Yeah, got to have that railroad, man, because we know the South doesn't mm -hmm. have very many. To get mm -hmm. They need that. Mm -hmm. The Union forces sought to destroy or remove these batteries as part of the effort to blockade. Well, Confederate I mean, that would States. be the idea. It's kind of like the objective. Like we said, they wanted the whole coastline gone. Mm -hmm. The battle was tactically inconclusive. Yeah. Each Nobody side won. inflicted little damage and no serious casualties on the other. We mean serious casualties. casualties Isn't a casualty casualties. serious no matter no, what? No. <laughs> casualties don't just mean death. 
Right. Casualties is anything. Right. You ever watch the movie Casualties of War? Yes. Great movie. Well, that means death, though. <laughs> they're they're speaking in the well, death. They're speaking in the death sense of casualties. Well, for her, but it was a casualty of war for Michael J. Fox's character too. His the casualty. His casualty was the mental part right. of freaking him up. There's right. More, there's more than one casualty. Right. So they're like, hey man, n- nobody nobody's reporting any type of damage, or if they are, it's the uh, burnt up grass or something. The universals were unable to dislodge the Confederates from their positions, or like just like we said, unable, right? Unable, and still no uh, serious casualties or any type of damages. The Confederates manning the batteries were unable to inflict serious casualties on the Union sailors or cause serious damage to the Union vessel. So, vice versa. Vice here. versa. Soon after the battle, Sunday, July seventh, eighteen sixty-one, the Confederates first used naval mines unsuccessfully. Which I'm, I don't know if we'll have. I don't think because. Aquaya, I don't think they right. go back to Aquaya. So the Confederates ultimately abandoned the batteries on the 9th of March, 1862. So as they moved forces to meet the threat created by the Union Army's Peninsula campaign. Ooh, Peninsula campaign. The U.S. National Park Service includes the, invade, the engagement in its list of 384 principal battles of the American Civil War. A principal battle, which principal. we will uh, cover, which no, I think the only one on the principal battle list was the uh, that we're covering today. I think is Sewell's point maybe, and um, no Sewell's Aquia and um, really? um, Philippi are all on the I mean, principles. They were major, but they were D battles. Right. They were D battles. Yeah. But they're still uh, major. Well, yeah, minor. General Lee dispatched Captain William F. Lynch of the Virginia State Navy to examine the defensible points on the Potomac mm-hmm. and to take measures for the establishment of batteries to prevent Union. To prevent Union vessels from navigating that river. Okay. On April 24th, 1861, Major Thomas H. Williamson of the Virginia Army, engineers, and Lieutenant H. H. Lewis, H. H. Lewis. of the Virginia Navy examined the ground at Aquia Creek, Aquia, Aquia Creek, Aquia. and selected Split Rock Bluff as the best point for a battery as the channel there Split could be. Rock Bluff. Bluff. They selected Split Rock Bluff as the best point for a battery as the channel there could be commanded from the point by guns of sufficient caliber. Obviously. So they're like right over the water, dude. So all they can do is fire down. They don't oh. have to worry about trajectory. Right. I mean, I guess they would if they want to make it far, but you know yeah. what I mean? If the ships are down there, all they can do is just fire down. And boom, bang, bang. They have a, a, a huge amount of area to fire if they're aiming down. <sighs> After Lincoln extended the blockade, both the Union and Confederacy then wanted to deny use of the Potomac River to the other side. Of they're course. Like, well, Potomac's pretty big, man. We need. Yeah. They needed that. They can't even split in half. There's no way. You just one go this way and another go that way, right? Uh, 8th of May, 1861, Major Williamson began construction on fortifications at the Aquia Creek Landing. For those of you looking at uh, Patreon, though, here's the outline of the Aquia Battlefield. Right. So literally right on the shore. Yeah. And then a little bit out. They didn't. This must be where the bluff is right here. It has to be. And then I don't know why they do this, though, because the yellow is... It's the boundary that uh, on the national registry. So is this where the ship sailed I in or know. something? Or yeah, stay in close to that. Came over here line. and then that's where they were going, getting fired at maybe. Possibly. How far do you think the guns fired? At least across the river. Either or they had to have come in here if that's where the main battle field is. Right. They had to get close. Hmm. That's a big ass river. That's fucking huge, dude. 8th of May, 1861. Major Williamson began construction on the fortifications at Aquia Creek Landing mainly protect the terminus of the Fredericksburg and Potomac Railroad, right? which had its northern terminus at the landing uh, from seizure. They're protecting it from seizure by the Union, huh? They're building up, dude. I've been saying this for the last two episodes, even uh, on the Sumter one, dude. That's all they did was as soon as, as, soon as they got a land. They got everything that they, was important. They immediately went. And started putting guns there to protect it, dude. That's all stupid. I think the North was like, okay, they're going to... But gonna... you don't see the North. Where have I not... I have not heard anything of the North, like, building up anything on their side. They don't have to. It's already there. I mean, is it, though? That was the case. Why wasn't it in Virginia already? Well, most people in Virginia were going to be with them. They ain't giving up a fight. They're like, here, take it. When they walked into that post office or whatever, they're like, take it. They walked into the bank. They're like, all right. And they kept their jobs. I guess. <laughs> about May 14th, 1861, Captain Lynch and Lieutenant Lewis, along with Commander Robert D. Thorburn and Lieutenant John Wilkinson of the Virginia State Navy, they erected a battery of 13 guns to protect the railroad terminal at Aquia. 
The battery was also a threat to close the navigation of the Potomac River in line with the original mission to sight guns to command the river. On May 10th, the Confederate authorities appointed General Lee to command Confederate troops in Virginia. Okay. So now he's not just commander of the Virginia militia there. He's actually the Confederate commander of Virginia. Of all whole. Mm -hmm. I am your master, he said. Mm -hmm. Brigadier General Daniel Ruggles assumed overall command of the batteries, although they remained under the immediate command of Captain Lynch at Aquia. The Confederate battery at Aquia landing was first spotted by the USS Mount Vernon, 14th of May, 1861. But the Mount Vernon made no attack at the position. Oh, because why would they? Eh, why? Hmm. Since the first battery at Aquia was at the river level and intended mainly to protect the railroad terminal, the Confederates strengthened defenses at Aquia before the 29th of May. Hmm. Two weeks, they're like, oh, we need to triple that. We need to, right. Wow. Right. The Mount Vernon spotted them two weeks before any shots were fired. And, right. and, and they probably seen the Mount right. Vernon as well. It was like, e guess what we're doing? Strengthening defense now. They added a second battery atop the bluffs to the south of the confluence of the Aquia Creek. To the, the Potomac, right? As the, with, which was like, dude, this is what we said in the beginning. So they went, so they went, so that's the creek right here. Right. It was a, it was so originally went, selected in the scouting party in the beginning. They're like uh, south of the confluence. So this is the confluence where it meets. So that yeah, right here is where they right. put the bluff, and then boom, they're firing from here, and all that's fortified with guns, dude. I mean, these guys are just building up everywhere. I can't believe. Why it. is it that on this side, which I'm assuming the Union has control of, why are they not building stuff? Why not? And they should have went to that bluff in the very beginning. Who, the Confederates? Yeah. Well, they... Well, Why would you not? Now they know. <laughs> right. That was important, I think. That little part right there well, was for, important. For, for a year, at least. At um, least. On May 29th, they converted 250-ton paddle wheel steamer mounting three guns called the USS Thomas Freeborn of the Federal Potomac, Potomac Flotilla under the command of Commander James H. Ward attacked the Confederate batteries at a quiet to little... To little effect, there's that, there's that, um, there's that phrase again. Confederate Captain Lynch reported that the Thomas Freeborn fired 14 shots and only wounded one man in the hand. Oh no, got him in the hand. So wait, was the Confederate guy the first official like injury besides the two that got blown up at not blown up at, but uh, I guess blown up at uh, Sumter. He's no saying other. they fired for the Thomas Free. Yeah, they wounded one in hand. So that Confederate guy got his hand. Right. So he's the first official injury. Right. I'll besides, say. like from the, the, the other, other side. One. Yeah. Wow. Uh, on the following day, on May 30th, the Thomas Freeborn returned. They said, I'm bringing back up the in the form of USS Anacostia, which was a 200 ton vessel with two guns, and the USS Resolute, oh. which was half the size of the Anacostia, so 100 ton, and engaged the Confederate batteries for several hours again with what? How? Little effect. How? I just so, don't get it. <laughs> the largest guns of the squadron were 32 pounders. On June 1st, the Thomas Freeborn, Anacostia, and Resolute. And the sloop of war, ooh, the big guy, ooh. USS Pawnee, bombarded the batteries for almost five hours, firing over 500 rounds to little effect. <laughs> How? I don't know. I, I mean. Just don't make no sense. The USS Pawnee has 15 guns minimum, and they're they're just they, pounding on they them. They fired 500 uh, rounds on a river. I don't care how big the river is. You're getting to the side. <sighs> Captain Lynch reported no deaths or injuries of from course. From the second and third days of the shelling. Uh-oh. <laughs> Only to death. He goes, dumb. No bastards the killed bastards. chickens. <laughs> that was going to be, that was, he was going to be a good chicken, too. And they got Johnny's horse. You think he was mutilated bad enough where they couldn't eat him? Did uh, they eat him, at I, least? No, I think they mutilated him wherever they found on the ground. All right. It was already cooked, so they just ate it, ate it there. <laughs> well, they don't think they were, uh, what do they What do they do at the uh, Sumter? What do they call them? Were they uh, roasted the cannonballs? Oh. What right. do they call them? Uh, hot shots. Hot shots. Hot yeah. shots. Yeah. I don't think they hot shotted. Yeah, no. Right. Right. So he goes, We lost a chicken and we lost a horse. Yeah. But that's not going to stop us, guys. <laughs> no. We will if, if you bring think, force. If you think killing one chicken and one horse is going to stop this war, mm -hmm. then you mm -hmm. got another thing coming. And mm -hmm. old one arm or one hand Willie over there, he likes his <laughs> new name. He likes it. One hand Willie. He likes it. Lynch added that his work sustained from uh, some damage. Houses in the rear. They got knocked about, guys. They're fine, though. The railroad was torn up in three to four spots, but yeah, we can fix right. that. We can just, you know, put some new uh, spikes in and be all good to go. All right. Lynch said that he returned fire sparingly in order to save ammunition and because he knew none of the shots were actually going to do anything. Right. And because he could fire only when the ships came in view and range of his 
embrasures as the big guns could not be turned. They're like, I'm just one little spot here, guy. Right. They're fixed. All they can do is right. shoot one direction. That's it's like it. if you're hunting in the middle of a thicket and you only have one shooting lane. Right. You better hope that some bitch lands in that shooting lane. You better be quick. <laughs> so so see it, they fire. couldn't reach the ships only when they're in view. Right. And in front of them. So that when were the ships firing? They're firing, trying to stay out of range. So they didn't know. They didn't want to get close enough where. So they're just wasting ammo. Pretty much. I mean, hoping. I, I guess they, they're hoping they can do something. I mean, they're firing cannonballs too. So cannons, imagine a big ass. 32 pound cannonball blasting through a house or something if it made it that far oh the houses in the rear were knocked about and yeah, the railroad was about. torn up yeah so obviously it, they hit some houses and hit the railroad a couple times and mess it up but right so they were the, the ships were reaching shore with their stuff so Not how accurate. close were, how how close it wasn't accurate but how enough. close were the ships that's what i'm saying just far enough where they can do that so apparently they were far enough to hit land but not far enough for the guns to hit them All right no, we couldn't. Yeah, they're guns. Yeah, you only get a hundred yards with the with the rifle. No, I'm that. not talking about even a rifle. I'm talking about their big guns. Oh yeah, you gotta be close. The big guns cannot be turned. Yeah, you gotta be close. What that is was, a, what that is, was on land? What is a 32 pounder? First of all, yeah, that's like a freaking tank. Uh, that's a 30 pounder tank. 32 pounder guns. There you go. Yeah, they're big ass cannons. Yeah, dude. they keep them on boats. But that's what was on shore. Yeah, they put them on the edges too. Right, so, so you're you telling me those around. big guys couldn't uh, no, you reach can't the turn sheep? Those sons of bitches. I'm telling you, you're telling me they couldn't reach a ship? Yeah, when it got in front of them, and they better be hoping oh. they got their aim right. And every time the ship moved, they couldn't get in. If they can't move them, thirty pounders were just had a shot five hundred yards. Five hundred yards. Yeah. yards. Yeah, that's nothing. That's nothing. Wow. Yeah, so they weren't doing anything. They do, the ships weren't even come clear near five hundred yards. It was just like we were saying earlier. They're they're slamming their chests on the top of the building. Both of them guys are nobody's doing anything. They got little helicopters coming in with little bullets. That's, that's not Herman King Kong, and they're both King Kong right now on top of a fucking mountain. Okay, so what guns were Building. on the USS Pawnee? They had uh eight by nine inch guns and two 12 pounder guns. Mm. So the 12 pounders are nothing, no. they're not firing as, no, as near as the 32 close. pounders. Yeah, that's close, right. So, yeah, they weren't doing anything. Yeah. So they, they had 10 guns on their ship, 9-inch guns, and the 9-inch the, the guns might have went all it was, All it was, it was like a show of force, man, like we've been saying. But the 9-inch guns probably went far. Oh, I'm sure, but they did little to no damage unless they hit somebody. Right. By the time it got to them, it was just a heavy ball bouncing against the wall. That's crazy. <laughs> Pretty much, they could like, it's like rolling on the ground. They One guy stop, can even they just catch stop it, it with really. their foot. Right. They're like, yeah, I don't think so, bud. Nice try. It's like dodgeball. Honey, you're out. <laughs> right. <laughs> Firing uh, over 500 rounds, anyways. The USS Pawnee and the other three ships. Right. Like, li- nothing happened. Right. Uh, and again, Lynch reported no deaths, no chicken injuries. Chicken horse dead. Bye. Yep. Chicken horse gone. Save ammunition, ranges, bridges, nonetheless, battle. Uh, yep. Houses were knocked out. Nonetheless, during the fight, both Thomas Freeborn and the Pawnee took minor damage. So these guys, the boats are getting... They were hitting them, yeah. Look, I would rather have my house get knocked about... Than my uh, ship. Get knocked about in water and have to sail back and retreat. No. No federal sailors were seriously wounded or killed, though. No. Well, following the Battle of Aquia Creek, the Confederates reinforced the defenses in the area by construction a third battery on the bluff at Aquia and a fourth across the mouth of the Aquia Creek at Brent Point. Hey. On July 7th, Confederates placed mines off Aquia Creek in the Potomac River, marking the first such use in the war. Wow. The mines, which were 80-gallon casks, supporting a boiler iron torpedo and enough gunpowder to blow up a ship the size of the Pawnee, wow. were spotted by Pawnee sailors as the devices were floating towards them. Of course they hey, were. The first such use in the war? Wow. These guys are just like, hey, let's just blow these. So those are the ones they are like... I wonder if they're chained and fit, you know, anchored to right. the floor anchored or to the ground. are they just floating? Or just floating? I don't, I don't they think they... the devices were floating toward them. Mm. So they're probably just let them go right. in the river and hopefully see what happens. Come back again. If they hit That's one, they dangerous. hit one. Okay. Well, they weren't, they didn't clearly didn't have no boats in there. So. All right. Mm. Mm. Ain't that crazy. Mm-hmm. The mines were later removed from the river by sailors from the resolute. Although one of the mines actually sank into the river. Well, I bet you it's still there. 
By the end of October in 1861, the Confederate batteries effectively closed the Potomac River for a short time until the Union Navy slowly discovered that the batteries could not hit passing vessels. They're like, they can't hit us. Probably due to, at least in part, to poor quality of gunpowder. So that's the, I never they think, had terrible gunpowder. I didn't ever think about that either. Like South had terrible. If gunpowder. you have nasty, like mol- Just, or right. even kind of wet gunpowder or whatever, it, it's not like it'll go off. But the, it's like the, the the mixture's not right. good enough. It's not going to give a big explosion. So yeah, to get that force you know? out, and they had that was a problem with the South. They you never hear about that faulty equipment. You never hear about that. Despite the Union Navy's conclusion about the lack of threat from the Confederate guns, the Navy forbade civilian traffic on the Potomac River while the batteries were in operation, obviously. Right. In the event that Confederates might score a lucky... <laughs> no, just stay off the river, guys. Yeah, just stop. You don't want to give them any... Um... Right. Lincoln on top of it. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to give them any um, reason to celebrate there. Right? right. After Major General George B. Hey. McClellan took command of the Union Army on November 1st, 1861, Lincoln repeatedly requested that McClellan oust the Confederates from these positions, but McClellan did not move. Look at He's this. not even listening to the president. Here's something here. I'm just, uh, it's, it's something that you could say at the end of all this, but do you not, the Union Army changed lead generals at least four times in the war. Confederate Robert E. Lee was the main general to the whole war. No. Yeah. He's not the main general now. Until he got that. No, he was. He's the. Yeah, he commands the whole thing now. No, he commands Virginia. And the whole Confederate. No. So he com- Virginia's not in the Confederate yet. I mean, once he does, he comes. Uh, he commands the Confederate Army in Virginia. We in just, Virginia. We just stated that. Right. But once everything gets set and it's actual. Lee doesn't. Lee's the leader. <laughs> but, but there's another general right now. Right now, because it's not. They're not part of the Union or the Confederate. It generally Lee right now is the leader of the Confederates in Virginia. In Virginia. Right. What is that? What are that word before Virginia? Confederates. Well, Virginia, even uh the now they are. Yes, they are. The 23rd was the vote. Right. And this is the 29th, and 30th. We, and we still haven't even got a formal gov- a formal anything yet. Uh Davis hasn't even been inaugurated right. yet. That's what I'm saying. He comes in 62. But still, the Confederate Virginia is officially part of the Confederation right now. As we're reading this, during this uh, Quiet Creek frown, right. Uh, stuff. Right. So, But not the actual. Yes. The actual Confederate Army comes in next year. Oh, by the time Lincoln ordered McClellan to take action against the batteries in General War Order Number 3, on March 8th of 1862, McClellan moved against them. The Confederates had abandoned the positions by then, though, and nothing happened. All right. Too late. Too late. But it says McClellan did not move. All right. President repeatedly requested, and McClellan's like, mm, No. <laughs> I did not do it. He's like, it's not time. This just shows you right here. What wow. the screwed up the union is right McClellan now. McClellan was not that great of a uh, general, as you will see. The Confederates abandoned the batteries in early March of 1862 when General Joseph E. Johnson, Johnston, recalled their garrisons in preparation to defend Richmond at the start of the Peninsula campaign. We got to go to Richmond, guys. Leave this. Leave this. Got to go. March 9th, 1862, sailors on the Anacostia and the USS Yankee noted unusual fires and explosions at the Confederate batteries at Cockpit Point. Cockpit Point. Must be just like a little cockpit point there. <laughs> and Shipping Point. And Union forces discovered that the Confederate batteries at Aquia and the, along the Potomac River had been abandoned. They're like, bye. They're like, wait a minute. They, 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 they stopped going over there. They're like, it's been born free for all. There's three well, families think, living. Well, this is 1862. I think the Union's coming in on these guys. Now. Right. The Union Army used the wharves and storage buildings at Aquia Landing until the 7th of June, 1863. So they used it. Nice. Yeah. When the Army headed north for the Battle of Gettysburg. Mm. The Union Army used the facilities again in 1864 during the Overland Campaign. Which will all come to um when it comes to that time but this is the, the south should never open this relinquish that spot well, obviously look at gettysburg and then overland campaign dude two major i mean the south obviously didn't have a choice yeah <laughs> so which brings us to our last battle of the night the battle of philippi formerly uh part of the western virginia campaign formed as part of the western virginia campaign and was fought in and around philippi virginia which is now west virginia on june 3rd of 1861 only one day battle here uh, Union victory, uh, our first, well, I guess since Sumter, our first actual victory from either side. Right. Um, a Union victory it was the first organized land action of the war. Wow. So this is the first land battle, though generally viewed as a skirmish rather than a battle. I mean, take it or leave it. Right. However, however, How Ill, the Northern press celebrated as an epic triumph. <laughs> of course they did. And this encouraged Congress to call for the drive on Richmond that ended with the Union de- 
50 feet at bull run in july which we'll will, see we're that. coming up really fast they got cocky oh this ain't that hard mm-hmm. <laughs> um as the first of series, as the first of a series of victories that pushed Confederate forces out of Northwest Virginia, it strengthened the Union government in exile that would soon create the new state of West Virginia. So right. this is the start of West Virginia, number one, and the first land battle of uh, the Civil War. So we're getting into it now. As the largely untrained Confederates had fled the battlefield with barely any resistance, the Union jokingly referred to the engagement as the Philippi, the Philippi races. Right, the Philippi races. <laughs> so those guys were running so fast that they, they, they were having a race out of right. there. I mean, Uh-oh. They, the union picked a, a weak little spot here to gain some. Hey man, press. you can need to, you need to get morale and momentum as any 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 place you can take it. Right, right. now, they needed after what was going on these last couple weeks. Right, they needed all the momentum they could hit. Robert E. Lee's thinking is like, that's fine. Come on, you're gonna try to come through the back while well, I ain't got two guys guarding that. Why don't you come up through Southern, where I got fifty guys and cannon and horses? It's fine. It's fine. After the commencement of hostilities at Fort Sumner in April, Major General George B. McLennan returned to the Army and on the 13th of May assumed command of the Department of Ohio, headquartered in Cincinnati. McClellan planned an offensive, which is now the state of West Virginia, that's what we just said, which he hoped would lead to the campaign against the Confederate to uh, Richmond. Mm-hmm. That's what he thought. He's like, this is, if we want to get is, to Richmond. This is, our, this is our path to Richmond right this here. This is our path to Richmond. Right. His immediate objectives were to occupy the territory to protect the largely pro-union populace in the counties along the Ohio River, yes, right. and to keep open the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Oh. A critical supply line for the yeah. union. Can't, uh, can't, uh, can't relinquish that. You ain't getting On May 26th, a few days before the uh, battle, McClellan, in response to the burning of bridges on the Baltimore and Ohio near the town of Farmington, ordered Colonel Benjamin Franklin Kelly, 1st West Virginia Infantry of the Union, so they already had a West Virginia infantry uh, with his regiment and company a of the second West Virginia infantry to advance from Wheeling to the area and safeguard the important bridge over the Monon Monongahela Hala Monongahela 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 River at Fairmount at a distance. It's about 70 miles southwest, southwest, <laughs> southeast of Wheeling. Jeez. Holy southeast, crap. southwest. <laughs> Kelly's men were supported by the 16th Ohio infantry under Colonel James Irvine. After securing Fairmont, the first Virginia, first West Virginia advance again and seized the important railroad junction of they Grafton. Got they got it about 15 miles southeast of Fairmont on May 30th. Ooh. So now finally, finally, we see the Union coming in, advancing and and um, imposing their will on, on right. shit going nice. on here. Meanwhile, though, the 14th Ohio Infantry Regiment under Colonel James Steedman was ordered to occupy Parkersburg and then right. to proceed to Grafton after that, about 90 miles to the east. By the 28th of May, McClellan had ordered a total of about 3,000 troops into Western Virginia and placed Jeez. them under the overall command of Brigade General Thomas A. Morris, commander of the Indiana Volunteers. Oh, he like not Thomas, the Tennessee huh? Volunteers, the Indiana Volunteers. Yeah, Indiana. He's like, about that guy from Indiana. What's Three, his name? Uh, Morris. Yeah, 3,000 troops, though. That's the biggest That's um, single troop movement that we've seen so far. That's a lot. On May 4th, Confederate Colonel... George A. Porterfield had been assigned command of the state forces in northwestern Virginia and ordered to and was ordered to graft and to take charge of enlistments in the area. Ooh, As the wow. Union columns advanced, Porterfield's poorly armed 800 recruits. So we got 3000 versus 800 right now. Uh, there his poorly armed 800 recruits retreated to Philippi about 17 miles south of Grafton. Philippi was the county seat of Barber County, which had voted in favor of Virginia secession. Right. They had to be there. Uh, Palmetto secession flag had been flying over the courthouse since January of 1861. So even before they officially uh, seceded, this courthouse in Barber County or in Philippi they're had like, been flying the uh, secession flag. They're like, guess what? Nobody comes here except for us. This is, this is who we are. Either way, a Palmetto uh, secession flag was flying above the uh, courthouse since January of 1861. Way before the Confederacy was even a thing. Because Confederacy didn't officially form until February seventh, right. so or ninth, and these guys are well, because South Carolina already um, right. seceded in right. December. Yeah, but uh, Virginia, these guys in um, Barber County are like, we want to go with you guys. We're gonna, we will. We well, they were probably pissed when uh, Virginia was like, nah, I don't think we're gonna do anything right now. <laughs> oh, but we are <laughs> at, at Philippi. A covered bridge spanned the Tigart Valley River and was an important segment of the vital Beverly Fairmont Turnpike. Okay. While Portfield had a command of regimental Porterfield. strength. Right. 
had a command of regimental strength that was composed of independent companies that had not yet been formally organized into regiments. Oh, so not even Can't have that. Yeah. Most were local recruits from Taylor, Pocahontas, Upshur, Hardy, Pendleton, Harrison, B. Arthur, Barber, yeah. uh, Marion, and Valley Counties. So every county in Virginia. <laughs> right. And and of Augusta, Bath, Rockbridge, and Highland. Oh, the Valley Counties of Augusta, Bath, right. Rockbridge, and Highland. Right. right. Of. So these are cities in there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, inexperienced little 800 guys that know nothing. Right. Have rusty old rifles mm -hmm. don't take care of the, the companies were the letcher guards pocahontas rescues upshur grays franklin guards hardy blues marion guards harrison rifles highland county highlanders barber grays P potomac guards bath grays second rockridge dragoons churchville cavalry and the barber light horse cavalry nice jeez these companies were eventually organized in the 25th virginia infantry the 31st virginia infantry the 11th virginia cavalry and the 14th Virginia Cavalry. What's the who, difference? Who knows how to ride a horse? Okay. With the Barber Light Horse Cavalry disbanding after the battle. Colonel Kelly devised <laughs> a two-prong attack against Confederate forces in uh, Philippi, approved by General Morris on his arrival in Grafton on the 1st of June. The principal advance would be 1,600 men, Who's led by Kelly himself. This is the, yeah. yeah. 1,600 men, though, led by Kelly himself, and would include six companies of his own regiment, nine of the 9th Indian oh, this is Union, Nine of the ninth Indiana Infantry Regiment under against the Confederates, right? Right. So we got nine of the ninth Amendment entry. Oh, nine of the ninth Indiana Infantry Regiment under Colonel Robert H. Milroy. Milroy. And six of the sixteenth Ohio Infantry. All right. In order to deceive the enemy into thinking the objective was Harper's Ferry, they departed by train to the east. Oh. They disembarked in a small village of Thornton and marched south on a back road on the same side of the river as Philippi, intending to arrive at the rear of the town. Oh, they're coming up the rear. Oh, look at these guys. Meanwhile, the 7th Indiana under Colonel Ebenezer Dumont were sent to Webster about three and a half miles south of Grafton. No. They would they would unite with the 6th Indiana under Colonel Thomas T. Crittenden under, and the 14th Ohio under Colonel Steedman. The column with a total of 1,400 men under Colonel Dumont um, would march directly south from Webster on the turnpike. In this way, the Union force would execute a double envelopment Ooh. of the outnumbered Confederates. So they're Ooh. going this way. Uh, on June 2nd, the Union column set off to converge on Philippi. Under the uh, After an overnight march and rainy weather, both arrived at Philippi before dawn the following morning. All right. Okay, so now we're, uh, before we're coming dawn. in. Or what are we going from the north, south, or east, west? Either or, uh, they're coming in from both sides. Morris had planned a pre-dawn assault to be signaled by a pistol shot. The Green Confederate volunteers had failed to establish picket lines for perimeter security. Ooh, you got to have that perimeter. Choosing, up, yeah, you got to have the Isn't picket that line. like the first thing of camp? It is. Get your perimeter set. Choosing instead to escape the cold rain and stay inside their tents. Oh, pussies. A Confederate sympathizer, Mr. <laughs> Mrs. Thomas Humphreys, saw their approaching Union troops and sent her young son on horseback to warn the Confederates. Ooh. She's, she's like... He's like, the Union are coming. coming. The, the Union, Union are coming. That little hum the Humphrey boy. I oh, bet. Boy. As Mrs. Humphreys watched, the, she saw Union pickets capture her son and fire her pistol at them. Oh, oh she fired her pistol yeah. at them. She missed. But her shots began the attack prematurely. Oh, because her pistol signaled uh, Morris's pistol that was supposed to be uh, planning the right. assault. So now everybody went when they weren't ready. Oh, my. The Union attackers began firing their artillery, which awakened the Confederates from their slumber. Those who were armed fired a few shots at the advancing blue coats. Then Southerners broke and began running to the south, some still in their bedclothes. This caused Union journalists to refer to the battle as the races at Philippi. Those yeah. guys immediately took off. They were yeah, like, I don't want no part of this. Well, it's still dark. Yeah. Rainy, wet, nasty. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dumont soldiers entered the town from the bridge. Uh, Colonel Landers' ride down the steep hillside through heavy underbrush was considered such a feat of horsemanship that Leslie's Weekly, which was a magazine, I guess, gave an illustrated account of it shortly afterward. Nice. So, okay, must have been a steep little hill that... uh. Knew how to ride a horse on, huh? Nice. But Kelly's column had arrived from the north on the wrong road and were unable to block the Confederate retreat. Uh oh. Uh, Kelly himself was shot while pursuing some of the retreating Confederates, but Colonel Lander chased down and captured the man who shot him. Oh, okay. The Confederates retreated to Hutton's Hut Hutton's Huttonsville, about forty five miles to the south. Damn, those motherfuckers! They ran forty five miles. This a way forty five miles. Whoa. <laughs> Dang. Jeez. 
And I bet they made it there in 45 minutes. I'm sure like they a mile a minute. Like, they're <laughs> running a mile a minute. Uh, <laughs> wow. Can you imagine? Wow. And it's still like beginning worse. They really don't know what's going on. So there's like, oh, man, this is crazy. Right. Don't even have uniforms yet. Philippi was the first organized land action in the war. Oh, organized, yeah. Well, kind of failed at the end without catching all the retreaters but right uh they had a little battle at the fairfax county courthouse a couple of days earlier but that's not counted as uh there's probably some fatalities and stuff there Wait, what, what do you do the battle fairfax courthouse why was that not on the list because it wasn't part of the civil war it was, was the first land engagement of the american civil war with oh. fatal casualties what what but they don't consider it a uh they don't consider a, a union scouting party clashed with the local militia in the vill- village of Fairfax, yeah, some resulting militia. in the first deaths in action and right. the first wound in the field grade officer. Yeah, it was just a militia. The union had sent a regular cavalry patrol under Lieutenant Charles H. Thompson to estimate enemy numbers in the area at Fairfax Courthouse. They surprised a small Confederate rifle company um, and took some prisoners. Marr rallied his, or the Confederate Captain John Q. Marr rallied his unit, but was killed. Whoa. Wow. And command was taken over by a civilian ex-governor of Virginia, William Smith, who forced the Union retreat. The engagement is judged to have been inconclusive. The Union did not gain the intelligence it was seeking and had to delay its drive on Richmond, thus enabling the Confederates to build up their strength at Manassas. Uh, bull run. Wow. Um, Tompkins was criticized for exceeding his orders, although they had been sunlight and precise. Nice. Why was that not on the list? Right. One killed, two wounded, five captured. Hmm. There's that. We just gave it to him. Okay. Well, guys, that wasn't even on any list of battles of the Civil War, so this is why, I guess, crazy uh, could not be counted as such. Right. I and don't... and Union victory in this relatively bloodless battle propelled McClellan into the national spotlight. This is uh, the Philippine. The Philippine. The, Philippine, Philippine. Yeah. the Northern Press, hungry for battle stories. Oh, you know they were, dude. They, they presented it as an, chops. an epic triumph, oh. encouraging politicians to demand that a big advance on Richmond. We must march to Richmond. We must march to Richmond. Which became Bull Run. Or Manassas, whatever side you're on. Right. Uh, the civilian population of the Philippines were the first in Western Virginia to feel the devastation of the war. The town was primarily secessionist in sentiment, and many had fled south with as many of their valuables as they could carry in fear of the federal advance. In July, a month after the battle, it was reported that with the exception of our troop, it is almost deserted, meaning Philippi. Only three families ha- uh, have returned. Among them is Mrs. Mr. Wilson and family. Mr. And one of the Wilson! Most, one of the most influential families in Barber County. Hey. Oh, no, he's going back. He's uh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Barber County's mine. I'm coming back. Yeah, I'm coming back. And now I go more. more. Mm. I'm taking all. all right. A correspondent in the Cincinnati Times wrote, the village bears... More than any other I've seen, the ruinous effect, because these guys have never seen a war, dude. Right. Nothing. The ruinous effect of the war. Many of the houses have been sacked and maliciously damaged. Burnt down. Not that half that of them are now occupied. The Im- Im- inhabitants haven't fled. It was a rabid secession town, and the women yet leaned strongly that way. Right. A record book of soldier violations was found a few months after the battle containing the following entries. Edward F. Grant enters a complaint against Colonel McCook's 9th Ohio Regiment for breaking into the houses of Haynes and also, the reunion. Of course, they were. The union. Of course. But they're actually complaining and keeping track of it. But the record book was left, so nobody mm. heard about it. Mm. Right. Breaking into the houses of Haynes and Hobbiter on June 25th at 1 p.m. Two privates in the guardhouse were stealing glassware and vegetables. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. Vegetables. Well, four men. Go back on the road. Oh, yes. Four men in the guardhouse for theft. Oh, t- um, discharged. Ninety six men in the guardhouse were breaking into dwelling and houses. Of course they so were. These, I mean, come on. What are you gonna do, you guys? If you, what are you gonna do? It's war. Of course you're gonna happens. ransack the houses. It happens. Sorry to say, but it happens. I mean, of course you're gonna ransack the houses. You get any goods and products you can. Moving. I mean, you never know how long you're gonna. They be out say. There. They say the heinous stuff the uh, United States Army did to the Vietnamese was bad. And nothing compared to what happened in well, uh, America. I don't know about that. Mm. They didn't like. Yeah, they did. They didn't kill villagers. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah they if, did. If so rarely. And burned uh, a whole shitty uh, oh, damn troops city in, down. Troops in Vietnam were literally murdering wives and kids, dude. It's true. And it was the same way. No. In the war. Yeah. No. Especially. Not to, not to the extent of the Vietnam War. Uh, oh, uh, not to the extent, but it happened. Especially if you resisted. Crazy. Mm. Many of the men of the Philippi had left before or just after the battle. Some not returning until after the war and leaving the women to care for families and property. Look at these pussies, dude. Jeez. There were two significant Confederate casualties. Both retreated with battlefield amputations, okay. believed to be the very first operations of amputations on the old amputations. Well, I would imagine. On the old battlefield. 
One was a Virginia Military Institute Institute cadet. Font- Fontelroy, <laughs> Fontelroy, Dangerfield. Oh, geez. Oh, Rodney's great grandpa. And it's spelled with an I. Dangerfield is All right. The other Confederate was James E. Hanger. He is that regular. Hanger. <laughs> right. Eighteen year old from college. <laughs> Where are you from? College. No, college. <laughs> from college. College. After recovering and being released, Hanger returned home to Virginia. He made an artificial leg from barrel staves with a hinge at the knee. So that was oh. a thing back then too. When um. These guys were getting guy making a little, little prosthetic little when when these them. guys were getting their uh, stuff amputated. It was up to them. No, no, like medical people were no. advancing the prosthetic. Like these guys, the soldiers themselves were making their own arms and making their own legs, and that's the, the prosthetic game, dude. They 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 started it. They had to. There's, There's there so no many choice. people. Well, they they would get like wood or something just stiff. Where you couldn't move it or anything like that, and then they started doing their own. Uh, it's ridiculous. Designs if of it, they couldn't get that little lead ball out of your leg. Instead of trying to dig for it, they just cut your well, leg. It wasn't off. worth it. They just cut your leg off. It wasn't worth it. Right. Sorry about it. You have to you have to lose a leg. Although I was reading about amputations and stuff, a lot of times it was the last resort to even amputate. They right. tried surgery and right. to get the ball uh-huh. out, but if they couldn't. Got to get it out. And there was piles, literally piles of limbs everywhere outside of the doc's house, dude. His design worked so well that the Virginia, uh, here we go. There's, his design worked so well that the Virginia state legislature commissioned him to manufacture the hanger limb nice. for other wounded soldiers. After the war, hanger pa- patented his prosthetic device and, and founded what is now the hanger orthopedic group. This dude made a whole, a whole freaking lifetime generation business out Man, of um, his unfortunate. Was, right. it, was it an arm? As of 2007, Hanger Orthopedic Group is the United States market leader in the manufacture of artificial limbs. Wow. Good for him. Following the battle, Colonel Porterfield was replaced in command of Confederate forces in Western Virginia by Brigadier General Robert S. Garnett. 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 The short story writer and satirist. 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 Ambrose Bierce, 1842, circa 1914, was uh, a Union recruit at the Battle of Philippi. 20 years later, he wrote an autobiographical fragment he called On a Mountain. He says, we gave ourselves this atrocity, a a aristocracy, aristocracy, yeah. We gave ourselves this aristocracy, (laughs) (laughs) we gave ourselves this aristocracy of service, no end of military airs. Some of us even to the extreme of keeping our jackets buttoned and our hair combed. Yep. We had not been in action. We had shot off. Oh, we had. We had been in action. We had shot off a Confederate leg at Philippi, the very first battle of the war, and had lost as many as a dozen men at Laurel Hill and Carrick's Ford. Whether the enemy had fled in trying, heaven knows why, to keep us away. The quotation marks indicate the, the wryness with which Bierce and his fellow veterans, who were to undergo far more heroin fights, must have regarded the designation of the first battle. Mm. Well, good for him. We had uh, in this battle, which was the, what the first land one, right? Uh, we had 3000 men for the union, 800 for the Confederacy, four killed or wounded for the union, 26 killed or wounded for um, the Confederacy here. So that's our, uh, our that's first a, bloody battle. It's a significant and it's only rated a D on the uh, battles of the. Uh, it wasn't even a battle. Dude. They call a lot of them off guard. That's a. Yeah, they they ran them out. They routed them. Right. Is what is what this says. Union forces route a small Confederate detachment in Western Virginia. I mean, we didn't come prepared. What do you want me to do? What Next do you, week is going to be better. What do you want to do? We're going to prepare for these guys, and we're we focused. We just went focused today. <laughs> 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 they caught us. Off, they caught us off guard, and, and and we you know we had to run with our tails between our legs. We'll get them next week. That's that's it for the battles of Gloucester Point, Sewell's Point, Sewell's, Aqui, Aqu- Aquia Creek, Aquia. and the Battle of Philippi, which was the first Philippi. land battle in the war. And that took, these all took place through from May 7th through June 1st or 7th. So Jeez. now we're getting June now, 3rd. Now we're getting a little more aggressive Union Army. Right. June, Union are, uh, but in like, the back ways, you know what I mean? Right. Like let's let's go this way. Let's 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 try to come well, through. They're trying to right. that's the war. They're going right. front and back, trying to escape them in. But 
yeah, a lot of stuff there, but uh, the first couple battles, Professor Gloucester and um, Sewell's, Man, all, just... all you had was stupid, oh, I'm going to fire at you, yeah. and then I'm going to turn around and leave. I'm going to fire at you, and then I'm going to turn around and leave. It was just fun. Um, it, was a, a measuring, think, it was a measuring of your penis contest. Uh, right. I think Philippi is the one that really set it off, to be honest with you, of uh, stuff that's about to happen, because right after this, on June 5th, we got the Battle of Pick Point, which was an early skirmish between uh, gunboats again, so we'll see how that goes. What's really gonna set it off is Bull Run. That's Obviously, gonna. Well, that's obviously. gonna. That's... Well, we got a couple of small battles before that because we got um, Pig Point on June fifth, June tenth. We got the Battle of Big Bethel, mm-hmm. which is a C rated uh, battle, so, so uh, decent. Might have something there, and then we move to from June tenth. We move to June nineteenth, the Battle of Cole Camp, and then we'll probably also do um, depending on the the length of all those. We'll move right. to or nope. June 17th, to be fair, yeah. before the 19th, the Battle of Moonville, which is also a C-rated battle. So we'll probably do uh, Pig Point, Battle of Bethel, and the Battle of Moonville, which is uh, Moonville, the first battle to take place in uh, Missouri, as far as I am I know, because all the other battles have been sure, Virginia yeah. so far. Yeah, Missouri is getting, and that's way over by, yeah, because New Orleans and Louisiana are fighting. Yep, because Pick Point's still in Virginia. Well, Louis, Louisiana right now is like splitting that between they want to go with the Union and they want to. What's that got to do with Missouri? It's weird for Louisiana to be way down here and be want to be a union. Does Louisiana ever join the Confederacy? I'm not sure. Um, but yeah. I don't think so. Battle of Boonville. First battle of Missouri in Missouri. It was the first battle out of Virginia, period. Right. Well, no, I guess South Carolina, Sumter, Man. that doesn't count, though. Yeah. We count that. And then... Um, they put that as an A, just because uh, it was the first. the first one, yeah. <laughs> We still got a lot before the Battle of Bull Run, yeah. which is just in which a month, is, which is just in a month's time. But we have about seven or eight more little smaller battles before that. So, yeah, we'll be back next week for the Battle of Big Bethel, the Battle of Pick Point and the Battle of Boonville. Ooh, and, Boonville. Uh, um, right now, Bethel and Boonville, they're split one one Confederate and Union victories right there. So and I think why don't we, why don't we just spoil it now? Because I think Pick Point. Pick point also won by Confederates. So uh two to one victory next week from Confederates. Yeah. Gloucester Point, Sewell's Point, Aquia Creek, and Philippi. That's gonna do it for episode three of Battles of the American yeah. Civil War. We're just now getting started. We got our first casualties of war, official casualties. I don't I don't know why we're celebrating that, but I mean we, we all know we're here for the bloody goriness of the shit. Yep. First of all. And uh second of all, if you guys want to see this on video unedited and a lot of time, because we're on Two hours and eight minutes in this episode we can do right. with a lot of stuff that probably won't get featured on this um, podcast episode just because we can't do a two hour podcast mm. episode mm. for you guys. But you can see two hours of it unedited and in video version on patreon.com forward slash bang dang only two hours a month, two hours a month, two dollars a month for this show. Outlaws and Gunslingers and Lee and Corey on the case, plus a special show every month. Lee and Corey. Um, exclusive to you guys. Mm. So <clears throat> guys. Just give Lee and Corey a listen. It's a it's a little spoof. You guys like comedy. Lee and Corey on the case. Private investigators on, taking man. on crazy investigative cases. Uh, comedy galore. Right. Kind of like an improv uh, fictional right. um, little podcast that we do. So go check that out. Lee and Corey on the case. And we will be back next week for those aforementioned battles. This is officially four. Well, we'll be back. Are we calling it weeks? We can't be weeks. Huh? This is battle number four. No, or, or this, is, be... this is episode number three we're doing now. We'll be back next week for episode number four. We're on battle one, two, three, four, five. We're we're five battles in, and we'll be eight in um, by next week. So 